and I started speaking and I was feeling pretty good. But somebody at the back of the room reached into their handbag and then somebody else reached into their jacket and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're getting their phones. They're really boring. My subconscious was yeah, telling me stories. But then I saw that they were getting out a little notebook. It was so sweet. And I looked around and all these people were taking notes using the phone as a, a light and writing things down. And I just felt so happy in that moment that I, I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. I'm definitely living my purpose. And it's not just me who loves this stuff, but it's actually having value for other people. Mm. So that was beautiful. Hello and welcome to Season 2 of The Push Podcast. This is the podcast where we explore the real stories behind what makes entrepreneurs and business owners the successes they are today. I am Jack Ferguson, a small business growth strategist, and I will be your host. I believe the best way to learn and be inspired is to listen to the experiences and stories of those you respect. Their real experiences, their real story, warts and all. Honest storytelling is what this is all about. Show notes can be found at bethepush.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget to hit subscribe wherever you are listening to this. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. Today I am interviewing Sally Prosser. Sally is a voice coach who helps people realize their best voice and embrace public speaking with confidence. She's a former TV news reporter, company spokesperson and speech and drama teacher. Sally has her own podcast called That Voice Podcast and enjoys making comedy TikToks like reading song lyrics like a news report. We cover a lot of ground in this episode. Sally was very open and generous in sharing her story. We talk about how she built such a large following on TikTok and what that has done for her personally, how to deal with negativity when you have such a large following, what holds people back when they aren't utilizing their voice properly and how to overcome this her experience building her business and what she would say to others thinking about building their own business. What her best experiences in business have been? You heard one of those experiences at the start of this episode, but there's others. Some of the biggest challenges in her career and even what her biggest on-air blunder was. It's quite a funny story. I'm sure you will enjoy this episode. Sally is a great person and was a pleasure to talk to. Let's meet her. Hello, Sally. How are you doing today? Good to have you here. Great to be here, Jack. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my my pleasure. I was very excited about having you on today because you're my first TikTok superstar I've had on the podcast. I believe about 286,000 followers (laughs) at the moment. Um, What got you on TikTok? Yes, it was one of the random things to happen in 2020, going TikTok viral. So I first uh, got on it because Gary V, he said... I felt to me personally, even though it was just a video to everybody, where he said, get on LinkedIn, get on TikTok. I'm giving you the keys to the effing kingdom and you're not executing. So I was pretty much frightened into joining the platform. Right, okay. (laughs) And I joined before Christmas 2019 and there was quite a few months of some pretty awful TikToks before the first one went viral. Okay. What was it like starting on the platform? Like it was was hard to, to adapt, was it? Or is that what you're saying with those first few? I think, and this is the advice I give to anybody who's interested, you have to be a consumer. You just have to get on there and watch for it to make Mm. any sense at all. So I found the more that I watched, I got more used to the platform. And they always say, use trending music, use trending dancing, this and that. But my first viral video and most of the ones that go really well are just me talking straight to camera. So that's an interesting thing. If, if, you want to join TikTok and you're worried about the transitions and the music and the dancing, don't even worry about it because if you can just give value straight to camera, that's what works really well. Awesome. And how long does it take you to make a video on average, would you say? Oh, it depends what style I'm doing. Sometimes I do one with 20 transitions and I spend the whole day doing changes and wow. <laughs> moving around the house, which is, I enjoy the creative process. Sure. But other times, like the one that went viral for the first time, I threw up my phone and I did it in one take and posted it without even thinking twice. It took me about 15 seconds. Well, actually, no, it didn't. The whole, the TikTok went for, I think, 35. So, okay. <laughs> so a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. And what was in it? What was that video? Oh, 
I sound pretty mean in it. I say, don't do these three things if you want to sound competent, confident and credible. And then I talk about vocal fry, which is like this crackly sound, the rising inflection at the end of every statement and um, are like using lots of filler words. Okay, cool. And do you think that what you do is suited to that platform, like like your business and teaching people voice and that? Is that is that what's helped you as well? I think the platform is just suited to me okay. because it's fun, it's short form, it's not yeah. too serious, it's a bit self-deprecating and so it suits my personality. <laughs> yeah, right. No, fair enough. Cool. Three million likes as well I saw. I'm like, this is just incredible looking at your, um, your platform. But let's have a little chat about... Um, you as a voice coach, so you're teaching people how to how to speak. A lot of people don't like their voice. Why not? Oh, <laughs> I think that's changing. I think part of it is we're not used to hearing our own voice played back. Like, Jack, you as a podcaster, you'd be hearing your voice played back, and I'm sure you've got more comfortable with it the more that you hear it. And my nieces and nephew, like, they're on their phones all the time and playing things back. And so I wonder whether a lot of it is just we're not used to hearing it. But it's also because when we hear our own voice, it's vibrating in our own head. So we walk around with shower voice, I say. Mm -hmm. So we actually sound better to ourselves Mm. than we do to other people. That's an, that's an interesting point. I remember when I was young and I uh, made my first album with my band and the singers would say they'd go in and they'd record their, their track and they'd come out and listen to it afterwards and they'd say, do I really sound like that? They, they were blown away that that's actually how they sounded. Do we not know what our own voice sounds like to other people? Well, I guess we do when we hear it played back to us. I guess so. Yeah, I think part of it as well is we don't really listen while we talk. We're not listening to our own voice. And I know that to be true because I'm at the stage now where as I'm speaking to you now, it's exactly how I hear my voice played back. I do do a lot of recording though. That is true. Okay. So is that the only reason why people dislike their voice so much? There seems to be some real, this is a real personal thing that you're dealing with here, right? Oh, voice is so personal, isn't Mm. it? And we're humans. So we just are self-loathing. We just love to hate things about ourselves. And so I feel like that is part of it. Yeah, so why, why, do, why are the common reasons that people aren't utilising their voice properly? Like, well, how, do you, how do you help people? Yeah, so there's three main barriers, I think, to people being able to use their voice. And the first one is a lack of awareness. A lot of people say, Sal, voice coach, didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> Let alone, oh, wow, can I, can I change my voice? which you absolutely can. It's just like an instrument. Of course, the qualities of the instrument will remain the same in some respects, but depending how well you play it, you can get very different sounds out of the one instrument. So there's definitely range to be had in your own voice. The second thing I'd say is mindset barriers. You know, we feel like we don't deserve to be heard or we've got nothing valuable to say or we're not a public speaker. And all of these thoughts make our voice hide inside us. And then I'd say the last thing is just the situation. So certain relationships and certain workplaces just don't enable your voice to be heard. And there are some situations where people come to me for help and I say, oh, it's not you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's who you're working with yeah, or it's right. who you're with. And, and when you do help people, what is that breakdown of perhaps the technical help you'll give versus maybe the more, I don't, I don't know if psychological support is the right term, but is it sometimes you know, a lot of one or a lot of the other. Absolutely. So sometimes it is just lie on the couch, tell me your problems, here are the tissues, let me put the kettle on, let's work through this. Because our voice is driven by our air and so we need to have a lot of fuel for our voice and that air needs to have a clear passageway to flow out. And so if there's tension, you can hear it in the voice. And while we can definitely do exercises in deep breathing, releasing tension getting the tone forward if that inner voice or that inner trauma or even just your mood of the day is not conducive to that then it's going to affect the sound of your voice for sure i mean the beauty of of me getting people on this podcast is i get to reflect on my own journey and i went back and i thought why did i i used to hate my voice hated it and i i went back and i thought of why and i hadn't actually thought about this in a number of years but i had a lisp when i was young and my f's or my th's were you know, I'd say th- three. Yeah, I can't even do it now, but I had to go to speech therapy. And when you're young, I guess that's what 
what can, well, for me, set a really unhealthy relationship with my voice. That and the fact that I was a musician and all the people in my town that were singers, there was hardly any of them, so they always had so much power. I, um, I remember being annoyed that I couldn't sing because I had to rely on all these other people that were, were hard to deal with. So do, do you find that a lot? Like, is there something like in someone's past, like a long way back that will hold them back from, from utilizing their voice? Oh, definitely. And I love what you shared there, because if you think about your first memory of public speaking, chances are it wasn't good. <laughs> like it was probably mm. standing up in front of a class, being judged or being marked and of course that flows over into us feeling like every time we speak we are getting judged we are getting marked i had one client who said i can pinpoint the time he was in year three and he put his hand up to answer a question and he got it wrong and the teacher said better to say nothing at all than to speak up and sound the fool Ooh. ouch and that's just one comment from one person And he was in his 40s and that was still holding him back from sharing this incredible expertise that he had. That one comment from when he was in year three. And I don't say this to scare people. It's about digging down into your own speaking story or your own confidence story and pinpointing, okay, what were those experiences? I'm not going to let them define me and going back and rewriting them. And and do you help people, like do they come and talk to you about that experience and that will help them move forward with their voice yeah a lot of the time it it involves a conversation and certain questions for people to even realize that that's what happened or that's what's going on okay Mm. yeah right interesting you're half 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 a psychologist almost (laughs) yes i definitely feel that way (laughs) yeah cool and have you always liked your voice ah yes i think so (laughs) I can't sing, by the way. Went to singing lessons for four years and the teacher told me to stop coming because oh, I really? just couldn't get the pitch right. I still enjoy singing, though. Yeah, I um, have loved performing from a young age. I was always with my hairbrush in front of the mirror. So I think that's why I love TikTok so much because I'm just reliving those younger years back with the hairbrush in front of the camera. And I pestered my mum to take me to the speech and drama. I really want to do this, want to do this. And um, the teacher who I went to, she wasn't taking new students at the time. But then she said I could audition. I don't really know what that meant. (laughs) But I went there and I read this little paragraph out of George's Marvelous Medicine, classic Roald Dahl book. And she said to me, that voice is going to take you places. So you had a really positive, positive reinforcement early on with your voice. Absolutely. And what's so interesting is that what has led me to become such a confident speaker because I've had that positive reinforcement, because my memories of public speaking were great. It was standing up and entertaining people at Christmases. And do you remember what what attracted you to wanting to, to get into this and get into the speech and drama and, and all this type of stuff when you were young? I honestly, I know this sounds a bit like a Maybelline ad, but I feel like I was born with it. So many other coaches have experiences like, oh, I was terrified of public speaking or a friend of mine, she's had a bit of a lisp like yourself and they've overcome that and then now they teach others how they did it. Whereas for me, I've definitely had my fair share of things to overcome, but when it comes to speaking, it's just something that I've always had in me. Yeah, cool. Mm. You talk about the impact this drama teacher had on you. This is um, as part of my notes. I can see this here. Can you speak to to that a bit, like in how foundational that was to your um, your younger years? Yeah, for sure. So since the age of about eight, I did speech and drama, and so I went and saw her every single week from when I was eight right through to my twenties. Wow! And she was so much more than a speech and drama teacher. She became part of the family, you know, she was a mentor, she moral support, (laughs) like a grandmother. She became like a grandmother to me. And during that time, I had some other dreams of different things I wanted to do. Yet now with what I'm doing, I look back and I say, yes, she is because of her that I have done everything that I went on to do and that I have this business now. And 
the way I just said that she was sh- so much more than a speech and drama teacher. Mm. I now try to be that for my clients. I want to be so much more than a voice coach because I'm sure you've got people in your life as well that just make such a difference. And especially when you're seeing them so often during those lovely teenage years. <laughs> Very formative years, those ones. Yeah. <laughs> so what is that that you want to be for people as well as a voice coach? A friend. I guess a friend. I'm quite... People do open up to me, but I think it's because I'm also an open book. So I'm, I share a lot about my life with people I work with as well. I'm very honest about how I'm feeling. And that's one reason why in my courses, for example, I have, I, of course I have an outline, there's a syllabus and all the rest of it, but when I go live, I just freestyle for half an hour. So I'm able to just feel the energy of the day, what's been going on for me, use the most recent examples and connect in with what people are feeling as well on the chat. So yeah, I really want people to feel that connection. I'm a, I'm a big believer in connecting with your own voice will help you connect with others. And for all of that to happen, people have to connect with me and I have to connect with them. Right. Okay. And is there any ways that you go about that specifically? Yeah, I think of conversations like a tennis match and you're only going to get a ball back if you hit it back. And this is why a lot, one of the reasons people struggle in conversations is because they just don't give any information. They, don't, they feel like they're shy, but really they're just a brick wall. And... I treat it like that. So if I want someone to open up to me, which is going to help me help them, I give them information about myself and then they're more inclined to give it back. All right. Well, let's, um, let's, I still want to stick to um, how, you, how it all came to be and, and, and what your younger years were like and all that. So you talk about a significant experience you had at a swimming carnival. Yes. So I was a 10 sessions a week swimmer growing up. <laughs> peaked at the age of 11 I think (laughs) and yes I was at a swimming carnival and it was in Wollongong outdoor pool it was about 16 degrees very very chilly and I was doing a it was 50 meters butterfly and I was very nervous about the temperature of the water I did the whole thing the swimmers do where you lean over and you splash yourself a little bit before you (laughs) go in to try to acclimatize yourself took off my big jacket The whistle blew, I stood up on the blocks, take your mark, and then everybody else dived in, but I didn't. I was just standing on the blocks, like, too scared to go in. And so I stepped off the block and went and got my jacket, and my dad was absolutely furious. He's like, Sal, what is the point of all your talent and all your training if you won't bloody dive in the pool? And I didn't realise at the time, but what... What fabulous advice. What is the point of all your talent and all your training if you don't dive in the pool? And that story is what really sticks with me whenever I'm feeling like I can't do something or execute. And I think one of the best attributes for me in business is I'm a woman of action. I'm a doer. I'll throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks, but I'm always trying things, doing things, making that move. Because while the talent and training is important, it's not worth anything if you're not diving in. And have you always been able to do that since that moment? Not always. Okay. But it's definitely a story now that I'm in business that sticks with me. And I feel like I I do follow that. And you share that with people, do you? Does that help them get over their own challenges? Yeah, I like to share that story at the end of workshops as well, because I say to everybody, you know, you can have all the skills and all the training. At the end of the day, you just got to have a bit of courage. Go and do it. So, you know, you go through you go through high school. You you um you obviously love your your speech and your drama at this age. What comes next? What comes after high school? So, when I finished school, I went to Brazil for a year. Nice. It was a Rotary Youth Exchange and that was, that was really great. And then I came back and went to university and I did a double degree in journalism and law. I think I'd seen Legally Blonde or something and I don't know, I thought I could just put her into courtrooms with a nice pantsuit and a dog in a handbag and <laughs> yeah. say your honour. But it became very clear that the only bar that I was ever going to end up at was the one with Happy Hour. 
but I did finish the law degree. <laughs> sure. So, so why is that? Why not? Why not law? Uh, for me, I found it was uh, too much detail. Dare okay. I say it? Yeah. <laughs> like, I, that's why I was attracted more to news and journalism because it moves faster. It's a new hour, a new bulletin, a new day, a new news cycle, and I was more attracted to that. And the experience I had with law was it was a lot of reading and. You know, one internship I was at, I had to go through this massive stack of papers just looking at someone's medical history. And I thought, oh, God, I can't do this. Just a lot of reading. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. And um, what came next? What was your first job? So my first job was speech and drama teaching. So when I was 16, I hadn't finished my qualifications by then, but you definitely got enough experience to start taking on your own students and my teacher wasn't taking anyone new on at that stage. Technically, she wasn't taking anyone new when I first started with her. Yeah. <laughs> that took a few yeah. years. And so I was in the front room of my parents' house in the garage and I'd have students come and learn speech and drama. And that was really, really great. So I had a four-year-old right up to year 12 kids and I helped them with the Steadfords and doing exams. And that was great. Yeah, the original working from home. It was. And it was funny because when I started this business, I remember thinking, oh, I've never started the business before. I'm like, what am I talking about? Like, I was very <laughs> entrepreneurial. <laughs> cool. So, what, what age did you start that? So, I was 16. Wow. Uh, yeah. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So, um, how long did you do that for? So, I had the studio until I went overseas so mm-hmm. it was two stints overseas the first one to brazil came back went to uni for a couple of years and then went to the uk and did a university exchange year and came back um and then after that i moved to queensland so that was saying goodbye to all my students yeah okay and so why the move to queensland oh it was a boy okay <laughs> right. well it was a mix my sister was living up there and she was pregnant and i thought oh, i'd be good to be close to someone close to her when she has the baby and my boyfriend at the time had work up there and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but he was Greek and I kind of thought, if there's any chance of this working out, I need to get him away from his parents. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of all of those things aligned to yeah. help with the move. <laughs> <laughs> Very strategic move by the sounds. Oh, uh, it didn't work out anyway, but it was all good. At least I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I understand you started another studio up when you went to Queensland, is that right? Yeah. So yeah. when I moved up there, I, I was in Tannum Sands, which is close to Gladstone. And yes, I just put little flyers up in the local library and rang up the local schools and set up a little studio there. But, oh, look, you know, partly the relationship breakdown and then also me feeling quite isolated. So when you're a teacher, you're generally just dealing with parents and kids. And I think at that stage of my life, I was craving work colleagues. And so I'd done journalism training and I was a radio news presenter as well in Wollongong. I know it sounds like a lot. At one stage, I was working five jobs at one time. So if you're thinking, is this woman 100? Well, you know, I kind of packed a lot into a few years and still found time to go out a lot. I don't know how that happened. But yeah, anyway, so when I was up in Tannum Sands, I thought, don't want to do this anymore. want to get back into reporting. And that's when I got the job as the news producer for Seven Local Queensland in Rockhampton. So you'd already, but you had already worked in radio at the time. Yeah, down in Wollongong. Okay, so that was, yeah, so that was already, did you, did anything interesting happen in that job by any chance? Oh, breakfast radio, things, yeah. interesting things are happening every single day. <laughs> my, my worst blunder was, <laughs> so it was a story about the tip. And it's very, very busy in in radio news. I think people don't realise the person reading the news is also the person doing the interviews, putting it all together. It's not like a whole team of people are helping. Not that it's an an excuse, but I read things a bit too quickly. And also I was too young to understand the value of the tip. Hadn't done any home renovations or anything like that. And so I told everybody that the tip was free for the day. (laughs) And Wollongong City Council has made the tip free. Anyway, I got get this frantic call from somebody from the council saying, are you telling people that the tip is free, you know? And I said, oh, um, 
uh, yeah, let me have a look. They're like, no, it's not free. People can pick up the mulch for free. They can't just come and dump their stuff for free. We have got a line of cars like down the highway. Oh, my God. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of people listening. Yeah. (laughs) I was very impressed. You have some real power there. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's that's an awesome story. I love that so much. So, what happened? Like, what did they... um, did uh, How did they deal with the big line of cars? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I just issued a mea culpa and said, oh, just a correction on our earlier story. <laughs> the tip's not free, but you can go there and pick up mulch for free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, all right, we've had we've had this happen and now you you go and get it. Was it a similar job you got in Queensland or was it not radio presenting this time? It was time? TV this TV. time. TV, okay. Mm. What, what got you into TV? I guess uh, the radio stations I worked for in Wollongong were connected to WIN, which is television. And so I'd used those contacts a little bit to get the experience in the TV newsroom. Even though I didn't work for WIN, I got my job with Seven. And yeah, I don't know. I definitely had to do more makeup and blow dry my hair a lot more in TV, which was annoying. Okay, (laughs) fair enough. And that was at that time, did you shut down the studio that you had up there? Yeah. And how'd this job go in in TV, in oh, Rockhampton? Yeah, it was definitely a baptism by fire. Baptism of fire? By fire? By fire, by I, fire think, I think. I think. <laughs> yeah. But it was fantastic. Like, it was very, very fast-paced, paced, very demanding. Anyone who's worked in regional news, it, you don't have a lot of resources to get half an hour of news to air. And... You're often caught between a rock and a hard place because if there's nothing happening, you're thinking, oh my gosh, someone lose a cat. I need something to fill the bulletin. And then if lots of things are happening, you haven't got the resources to cover it all. So it can be quite stressful. But I absolutely loved it because it is by far the hardest job I've ever had. And it's given me a great benchmark and a really good work ethic while I was there. And you do get to do some pretty cool things. I remember in Rockhampton, one story that stands out because it's a big military base is when the Antonov landed at the airport. And the Antonov is a plane that holds five helicopters. Right, So five helicopters go inside this plane. So it's enormous. It's really, really cool. And the nose lifts up. That's how the things get unloaded out. And I was there at the airport, probably not in my long pants and closed shoes like you should have for the <laughs> PPE of the airport. I'm in my high heels and my skirt. And someone said, oh, do you want to come up and have a look inside? Of course. I'm like, yes, I will. So I'm going up this tiny ladder of this massive military aircraft, poke my head inside, totally dark, and just all of these half-asleep Russians like lying in the plane. Right. Okay. Who he probably thought they're like, what's going on? Like, where are we? Went into the cockpit, and it was just one of those moments where I thought, how cool is this? Like, these opportunities don't come by for many people. And you talked about in your notes that you felt at that moment that the stress just dissipated that you had with the job. Yeah, for sure. You're running around so much, focusing so much on the bulletin and deadlines and all of this stuff. But it's when you do those really powerful stories, and there was lots of them over the time I was there, where you really realise how much of a privilege it is to be able to tell stories. Mm. Mm. Okay. And you talk about also that job being uh, not sustainable necessarily, like you were on, your, on a way to, to burnout, I think you described it to me as. Yeah, I was pretty crazy. Because like, every day you're thinking, What's gonna, what am I going to do the next day? It's not one of those jobs where you can have an easy day one day or or work really hard one day and then have an easy day the next day. Mm. Every day you've got the bulletin to fill. And so I became very work focused, which is okay. I think I still am. But you're doing long hours for not much thanks. And we turned the ratings around up there. So it was what we call win heartland. But over the time I was at seven, we were able to win the ratings, which was huge. And you're not on very much money. It's the nature of journalism, I suppose. But I remember 
getting a call from not even my boss, but my boss's boss. And he said, Sal, geez, those numbers are looking all right, aren't they? Everyone in media is a bit gruff. And he was talking about the ratings. And I said, yeah, it's really awesome, isn't it? He goes, oh, well, just keep, keep doing what you're doing. That's awesome. And so after that, I thought, oh, I think I might be able to negotiate a bit of a pay rise or something here because I don't feel that appreciated for everything I'm doing. And when I had the meeting with my boss just about how things were going and I floated the idea of getting something else, I remember him like laughing in my face, like kind of scoffing. Wow. Like, oh, I don't think so. Like, no way. And it was just that reaction. It wasn't anything personal. It would have been to everybody who asked. And I'm not much of a bathroom crier. I love crying, by the way. Okay. Like tears, nature's great cleanser. You know, <laughs> I'm not afraid of tears. And I like crying. But I had hardly ever cried in that job. And I remember that I went to the bathroom and I just had tears just rolling down my face. And I thought, this is not good. I'm feeling very frustrated, very exasperated, very overworked and underappreciated. And maybe it was time to look for something new. Wow. And did you feel like you, you, you were feeling that you were burning out as well? Not only did you feel unappreciated, but you felt, did it feel unsustainable? Oh, definitely. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How often were you, like, how much were you working? Well, it's Monday to Friday, but because you're also on call. So I was on call 24 seven and I wasn't provided a phone. I think right. it's different now. Okay. <laughs> Because if something happens on the weekend in your area, you're sort of expected to be on call to go and cover it. Okay. Yeah. And so there's just all, it's always in the back of your mind. You never escape it. Yeah, you don't. I, and I, don't get me wrong, I did love it. And maybe I was just a little bit too obsessed with it. That was the problem. <laughs> I probably needed a bit more balance in my life. But yeah, I was definitely getting burnt out. Okay. And was there something that happened or a moment that you remember that you go yeah, this is not going to, this is, I can't keep doing this. Well, it was the moment crying in the bathroom, but also when my best friend left. Oh, no. So my best friend, Eamon Ashton Atkinson, he's now in Washington and reports for Channel 10. He started working with me. We became great, great friends. And he moved on to Townsville for a job. And his replacement was great, but it just wasn't the same. So I think I... I knew that I couldn't stay there long term, couldn't recreate the magic. I'll yeah. have to send this episode to Eamon, he'll love me <laughs> <laughs> saying that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so things are starting to add up. It's just not going to it's not going to last at this stage. And is this about the time you move back to Bri- move to Brisbane, not back to Brisbane? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. again, n- another boy story. Okay. <laughs> I was going out with a country boy from Rockhampton and I guess I would have wanted to move back to Sydney. Well, to Sydney because it was closer to Wollongong and I had friends down there. And he was like, oh, Sal, a bit too much of a big smoke for me. You know, let's compromise with Brisbane. I thought, oh, yeah, no worries. That's fine. So we literally loaded up the horse float (laughs) and drove down to uh, Brisbane, which was pretty much around the time of Cyclone Oswald. So it was a very crazy time. And um, this is without a job? Without a job. Okay. Yeah. So I... I had a bit of an inflated sense of self, I suppose, because I thought, well, I've got a law degree and I've ran a newsroom and I've ran a speech and drama studio. Someone's going to want me for a low-level comms job, surely. But I found it really, really hard. I couldn't get anything and I I don't know why. I just wasn't getting callbacks, wasn't the right experience or a lot of that, oh, you're too experienced oh, for this job okay. kind of thing. And so I did get just an interim sales job where I was driving around to people's homes talking about an education program for their kids and the only good thing about that job was that I got to know Brisbane a little bit (laughs) because I was driving around the suburbs but that wasn't wasn't good no that doesn't um door-to-door sales doesn't sound too fun did you have any interesting experiences with that oh so many and especially when I first moved to Brisbane I didn't know the reputations of different suburbs and things like that. And I remember being uh, somewhere, 
I think it was in Wacol and pulled up to this house and it was the wire fence and the front yard was full of mutilated Barbies and broken toys. It's like that scene out of Toy Story, you know, the neighbour next door. Yeah. I thought, oh my gosh. I should have just u- listened to my instinct and mm. not gone in. But I, I walked up there and I knocked on the screen door, which was, you could see through, but it was locked. And there was a baby crying on the floor and I couldn't really see anyone else. I said, hello. And then this woman just started screaming at me and said, get the, get, can I swear on this podcast? You can if you want, yeah. I was like, get the fuck out of here. And she was going crazy. And I think she might have had a spoon or some kind of, utensil in her hand and she was coming at the door and I was like oh my gosh and so I just moved away went back to the car and I think drove around the block just to get away from the front of the house and I thought what on earth am I doing wow that's a that's an incredible incredible story so everything in you was screaming don't go in this don't go to this door don't go to this door as you see this yard yeah okay and um is that a time when you didn't trust your gut Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. There's been lots of times over my 20s when I didn't trust my gut. And now I do a lot. I'm a little bit (laughs) woo-woo. I've done my (laughs) human design and I'm actually somebody who makes decisions with my gut. And I've got a lot better at trusting my instinct. Yeah. I I often ask people this question because I don't know many people who they, when their gut has let them down, like we, sometimes we don't trust it and we don't, don't go with it, but when you look back, has it ever let you down if you had followed it? Oh, no, I, I don't think so. I think society makes us believe that decisions have to be made with our mind. It has to make sense. It has to be intellectual. It has to have reason. But as human beings, I believe we do make decisions with feeling. And there's nothing to say that a gut feeling is not more of an authority than reason. A lot of the time, our mind's just being polluted with the opinions and thoughts of others, Mm. and we're not sinking into what we really want to do or what we really feel is right. Yeah. And when did you make the decision that, no, from now on, my gut, I'm going with it? Uh, Yeah, definitely just in more recent years. Okay. Yeah. I've consciously trusted it. Yeah, right. Can definitely relate to that, because throughout my 20s as well, I was like, I didn't listen... And I cannot look back and go, every time it was right, every time you didn't listen, it was right and you just ignored it for whatever reason. Um, so now I'm the same as you. I will always trust every everything I do. It's gut first, really. Head second. It's challenging because is it fear or is it instinct? So when it comes to public speaking, for example, I'm sure a lot of people would say, well, I just have a gut feeling that I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> the gut doesn't feel good about it. I don't want to do it. And I'm like, well, is that your gut feeling or is that just your fear? Yeah. <laughs> so it's difficult to separate the two sometimes. Yeah, good point. <laughs> um, all right. So you, you decide this day you've got to get out of this sales job, I assume. Is that the day you made that decision? Oh, no. I think I kept doing it for a little while. But yes, it was never going to be a long-term thing. <laughs> mm. So what did happen? Well, fortunately... I had made some a lot of contacts in news from meeting journalists from my time being a journalist and most of them knew that I was looking for freelancing work in news and a friend of mine just happened to overhear in the Channel 10 newsroom, the news director saying, oh, we need another producer. Does anyone know anyone? And he messaged me and he's like, Sal, get on it now. Email now. And luckily I was at my computer and I was able to just send an email that seemed very innocent, you know. And because of the timing, the news director said, wow, (laughs) yes, come in for an interview. And I was right place, right time and was able to to freelance from there. And from that break, I was at Channel 10 and also the ABC. Very cool. And I think actually you've made some content recently around how relationships will get you further than your resume. Is that a TikTok you've done recently? I did do that recently and I fully believe that. That's my biggest... I don't want to say regret, but learning from my 20s, it really is not what you know, it's who you know. And I don't like that phrase because it sounds negative. It sounds like, oh, well, it's just who you know. It's not what you know, it's the relationships you build. Hmm. It's always going to be the relationships you build with people that are going to help get you what you want. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, makes makes perfect sense. So, was this um, this next job was this a little bit more sustainable than the one in Rockhampton? For sure, 
Okay. Yeah, I loved it. What um, what came after that? So, I was enjoying freelancing in news. Really, really loved it. And then in early 2014, my dad suddenly died. And, of course, I needed to have some time off. And so, being a freelancer, you you don't get <laughs> any benefits or anything like that, which is totally fine. And so, when I came back to Brisbane... I was getting a few less shifts and, of course, just feeling in a bit of a state of disarray as you would be with a death in the family. And then another contact, see, another (laughs) relationship building thing, said, Sal, there's this job going at Urban Utilities. It's a maternity leave contract. It's in PR. Like, you'd be great for it. And before then, I never thought I'd go into public relations. As a journalist, I really didn't like a lot of PR people. (laughs) Okay. I was like, yeah. oh God, you know, what are you doing all, all week? You've taken all week to write one press release. <laughs> Little did I know. My gosh, there's <laughs> PR's very busy. But at that time, it sounded great. You know, it was the consistent income. It was a bit of a change. And I was lucky enough to get that position. And then when the contract finished, I was I put on full time. And I was there for four and a half years. Being the glamour girl for water and sewerage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. So you talk about um, PR and journalism. There, some people might listen to this and go, "Well, what's the difference?" Some people might not understand how those two things are different. How are they different? Uh, two sides of the same coin. So often, the story that you'll see the journalist do, there's a PR person behind it and that makes it sound a bit too much like sales um so for urban utilities for example lots of things would happen in the news for example a burst water main and if the media is there they need to call someone to get information and so we're the team that they call to get that information or to get the spokesperson on the camera so it's you do reactive which is when things happen and you need to respond but also proactive stories which was getting the word out about the value of our sewage network. (laughs) So you're kind of like a journalist for your company. Okay. Trying to get out those good stories. Mm. And and how do you get journalists to pick up your work and and to spread the message for you? You think like a journalist. Yeah. What does that mean? (laughs) So if I was a journalist, what would be the headline? What would make this newsworthy? And this is what I found as well as a journalist. A lot of PR people would send out a, a press release and you'd say, well, this is clearly an ad. There's nothing newsworthy about this. And this is why a lot of former journalists are in PR because you need to give the journalists what they need. And even small things like when I was a journalist, sometimes a PR person would give me a press release and say, can you run the story? And I'd say, well, who can I chat to on camera? What pictures can I use? And they'd say, oh, you've got the press release. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't just hold that up to the camera for a minute 20, you know. So when you're in PR, you're saying, okay, right, I need to get people for them to talk to. I need to get vision, pictures, or if it's for the paper, what photo, you Mm. know, so you you know exactly what they need. And what's the difference between, you talk about, something sounds like an ad, what's the difference between that and something that's newsworthy? Well, that's, that's why it's the dark arts. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <clears throat> because it's a situation where everybody wins. It's, it's, a news, it's a genuinely newsworthy story that positions what you want in a, a good light. So, for example, we really wanted people to value their sewerage network or the sewerage service. <laughs> I know, you know, it's not just magic. Every time you flush your toilet, there's <laughs> there's stuff happening in the background. Of oh. course, my dinner conversation's a lot better nowadays. <laughs> I used to just always be talking about flushable wipes and fatbergs and these sorts of things. But one of the stories was when we were rehabilitating the S1 sewer that runs underneath Kingsford Smith Drive. It's the biggest sewer in the city. It was built by miners back during World War I. And so really interesting. And there's that historic element. And at the same time, we are sharing what's happening with their money, essentially. You know, like we're building this infrastructure, especially with water and sewage. It's so hidden. It's all underground. Yep. It just happens. Right? It, just, it just happens. Yeah, yeah, like magic. And so it was important to bring what we were doing to people's attention. 
And, and why was it important to get people to, to value it? Oh, we could talk about this for a long time. If people see more value in the brand, it is better for the business as a whole. People are hopefully more understanding if there is a water outage, hopefully more aware of what they're paying for when their bill arrives in the mail. So this sounds like an amazing job, Sally. Why move into self-employment? I know, right? Yeah. Stable government job, good money, good super. What was I thinking? (laughs) Uh, I, on the side, I was helping journalists with their broadcast voice. So I had a little tiny bit of a side hustle going on. And while I was at Urban Utilities, I was asked to do lots of different things that involved speaking. Like, could I interview this guest or... My CEO asked if I could MC the last day of the National Water Conference. And it was a big conference at the Brisbane Convention Centre, the one at South Bank. Yep. Yeah. yep. I was about to say Entertainment Centre. No, that's burned all different. And I, of course, redid the notes because they weren't what I wanted to say. And I did it, no problems. And it was big, big space. But all of those years growing up on stage and loving public speaking, it was no problem. And at the drinks afterwards, the CEO said to me, oh, Sal, you should be doing that full time. And I thought, oh, maybe she's right. And I was getting all this great feedback from people. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that within the next week, that's it. I handed in my resignation and thought I had no kids, no pets, no boyfriend at the time. I lived on goon and two minute noodles when I was at uni and I was perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. So I thought it can't be that bad. A few of us have been there. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And that was that, that comment was what galvanized that, was it? The, from the CEO? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Right. And you just went home and go, I'm going to resign. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you go into business. How's the first two months? How's the first month? Was it like you thought it would be? I know you've done a business in the past, but this new business now. It, it was the first time because when I was speech and drama teaching, that was more just one of my income streams, whereas this was the first time where it was just me. Although I was doing Airbnb hosting as well. So I was doing Airbnb hosting and I was renting out my car park and I had a few different emergency income streams. Uh, but it was, it was great. I had more work than I expected. But you really have to hustle. Like of the 10 people who say, wow, Sal, that's so fantastic. I'm so going to call you up for a session. Maybe one will. And that's the nature of sales, right? We know that. And so I had to do a lot of different meetings with people and hustling, as they say. But I haven't looked back. It's going great. Awesome. And how did you get so much interest so fast? I think I, part of it was LinkedIn and my existing network that sure. I already had. So reaching out the, to the existing network, offering to do things for free. I got a business coach at the start as well that helped in, make some good introductions. But like I mentioned earlier about that relationship building, it's just get, putting yourself out there. And, you know, so I went viral on TikTok last year. But I think some people think it's overnight success. Like, oh, the pandemic happened and you went on TikTok. But I've been posting on every social media platform every single day for more than a year before that. And going viral on TikTok, what was that like for you? Like, was that a, were you, were you surprised? Like, what did you, what did that do for you? I was totally surprised. I didn't even brush my eyelashes as the good people of TikTok pointed out. Oh, okay. They were like, oh. <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't believe it. And I remember just seeing the views like going and going and going. Because in the beginning, it just went crazy. It doesn't seem to happen like that now. It went crazy and I was getting about 10,000 new followers a day. But when that video was first blowing up, they talk about your phone blowing up. I know what they mean because I didn't know whether to like throw the phone out the window and just run. I was like, oh, what's happening? (laughs) Is this from all the notifications? Is it? Yeah, all the notifications and all of the questions and comments. And of course, whenever you reach a large audience, you're going to get people who don't like what you do. And I think I was a bit surprised by a lot of the negative comments that were made. And to the point where some of the feedback I got, because one of my other viral videos was about how to pronounce Australia. 
And again, didn't really think too much about it. It's just part of being a, a speech coach. Like, I don't care how you pronounce Australia, but, you know, that's just what the video was about. Yeah. Very sensitive topic. Enunciation. <laughs> yeah. I even had people write, you're a stupid American. What would you know? Yeah. So it was just such an interesting insult. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even know where to start to unpack that. And so I had lots of negative comments. I even had one person Photoshop the poo emoji onto my head and make a video calling me Australia's most condescending woman. But it's been really great because it really helped me find my own personal brand. And I really got to a stage where I didn't care and don't care what people think. And... I try to take negative comments and positive comments with the same emotional reaction because you've got to really find your self-worth from within and from the close-knit group of people that you have around you who you really care about. We can't be getting validation from strangers on the internet. (laughs) And, And that getting all this attention on TikTok helped with that, helped you to find your brand? Oh, definitely. Okay. Yeah, for sure. How did it do that? So a couple of ways, like I just mentioned, I think I really became just full on 100% in who I was. And of Mm. course, because the business had been running for a year, I had that, I guess, validation that it was a thing. So I was more confident to go out and really be myself. And the other part of it is, is it was short form. It was a bit funny. It was a bit playful. And I think on social media before TikTok, I'd done the whole try to be professional, nice photo, straight video, but people can't get to know you that way. Mm. Whereas on TikTok, I think people really got to know my personality and that's where the connection happens, right? Sure. Okay. And that can, when you're putting yourself out there, I mean, there's one thing to to post something, right? But there's another thing to post something you love and what's really you. Um, Was the negativity at first around those really authentic videos harder to take? To be totally honest, I haven't got that many negative comments okay, from the cool. really authentic ones. It's right. more just people disagreeing with how many syllables Australia has and, <laughs> and that kind of thing, which is totally fine. But it has taught me a bit about my approach as well. I've, I try not to be too prescriptive. Not, you know, you must do this and you must do that. Because at the end of the day, different things work for different people. And my concern is how you feel about your voice. I don't want to say, if you've got a high-pitched voice and you speak with the rising inflection and vocal fry and you mumble your words and you're happy with that, like, honestly, that's, that's great. Where I come in is usually because people feel a disconnect between who they are and what they represent and then how their voice sounds. So, for example, they say, I'm really, I really know my stuff. I'm really competent. But why aren't I getting cut through in meetings? And I say it's because we need to get down to that lower register. We need to speak with more intention. We need to speak with more clarity. We need to have a falling inflection at the end of your statement. And once we work through that, they say, wow, I really feel much more like myself when I walk into a situation. Ah, Very cool. Mm. Very cool. So what would you say to someone else who um, perhaps is getting, I mean, a lot of people don't have the, the platform you have, but, but people who are getting negativity, perhaps, what would you say to them and how to deal with that online? Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. I mean, in some ways it's, <laughs> I believe it needs to be better policed. You know, I work with, you hear stories from media personalities and I've got journalism students who I work with who've had things like rape threats ridiculous Mm. level trolling like that i haven't had anything to that extent so i feel like that level is absolutely a crime and i i look forward to the laws getting stronger around that but when it's just people with general negativity or hate it is about them it's not about Mm. you nobody living their best life is criticizing strangers on the internet you got to remember that. And so, so often I'll see these horrible comments and I'll just feel so sorry for that person. What I don't know what their age is. I don't know what their background is. I don't know what situation they are in 
to make them say that to a stranger on the internet. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a bit of a common theme. And so you realise that, you know, you're not going to get anything by going to war with them. In the beginning, I had a couple of back and forth, but I don't do that now. You know, it says more about them than it does about you. And it, it is also a lesson in where you get your self-worth from. I am, I would hate if TikTok collapsed tomorrow. My account got shut down. Because I have a lot of good videos on there and I enjoy TikToking. But I'd be okay. Mm-hmm. I'd be okay. What I, My business would be okay. And so I'm always checking that I'm not getting too heavily invested in that external validation. So that's what I'd say. And don't let that be a reason to hold you back from putting your voice out there and making a video. So often it's just a recurring theme, whether it be speaking on a podcast or putting an Instagram story out or saying yes to a conference. It's always, oh, what are they going to think? And what <laughs> yeah. if I say the wrong thing? Yeah. And oh, I just, I don't think I'm ready. Or why have they asked me? And so I really believe that we've got to be the main character in our own lives, be the star of the show. And if we don't learn to love ourselves and be confident in our message we're never going to get that invitation or or we're getting invitations and not saying yes to it and remembering that you can be the best brightest crunchiest apple in the box and some people just don't like apples so if you're pleasing everybody you're doing something wrong very cool. And that's that really comes through, I think, in in the content you put out there. Like, you know, you, you really you really watch your content and it is very you can look at it and think, This you know, you've really you really know who you are. Like, I mean that's that's the feeling I got when I watched it, which was, you know, quite inspiring to look at, I think, and I'm sure it is for a lot of people. I mean, maybe that's why you have so many followers, right? Because people are so inspired by 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 what you do. Is it <sighs> Is that a good path, do you think, to building that confidence and that knowledge of who you are? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for saying that because I feel like during 2020, I really did a lot of self-discovery work and really feel like I know who I am. And it's been so powerful. Since I landed on that, I kept getting asked to speak on podcasts and panels about personal brand. Like, oh, you've got such a strong personal brand. Meantime, I'm in the background Googling what is a personal brand. (laughs) (laughs) Discovering, it just basically means that you are okay to show up as yourself. I believe in learning through doing, but there also needs to be background work. Mm -hmm. So a lot of thinking, a lot of journaling and stuff like that definitely helps as well. And experimenting and being okay to look at content like my first viral TikTok video and saying, I would not make that video now. She sounds like a really stuck up school teacher. Like I don't like, I don't love that. I wouldn't do that again. Right. And being okay to, I guess, recognize that and be strong in who you are, but then also open to feedback. So I think you ought to be careful about that. Well, this is who I am and I don't care what anyone else Mm. thinks. I don't think that's a good way to be. I think you need to be, receptive Mm. to the people around you but as you say I'm glad that you feel that way about about my content Mm. because even if people don't like me I think they respect that I know who I am and what I stand for and that is the strongest power we can all have anybody who is truly themselves that's what becomes magnetic and a lot of it is actually breathing The most confident person in the room is the person with the most regulated breathing pattern. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just as a bit of extra information. You know, can you tell us about that? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so oxygen powers our voice and powers our body, of course, as well. And our breathing pattern is such a great measure for how we're feeling. So if you're feeling like your heart rate's rising... Breathe in quick and out long. So a longer exhale than an inhale is going to help slow that heart rate down. And you can hear it in the voice as well. We often think confident people are these big extroverted, rah-rah kind of people, which I am, let's be honest. But if you went into a party, the person who was on the table 
who'd had too many drinks and was telling this amazing story and going for it. They, there's nothing to say that they are more confident than the person just standing quietly by the dip, which is also me sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, really take that, use that, especially if you're an introvert. If you feel like you're an introvert or you're more quiet, that has got nothing to do with how confident you are or how effective a speaker you are. Hmm. Some of the world's best speakers, introverts. And do you start there when helping people with the breathing? Is that the most foundational thing that you teach? So we start with mindset. Okay. Always yep. mindset. Yep. Then we go into body, like how you're feeling, getting rid of tension, then breathing. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. And we breathe all the time and we're probably not conscious of what we're doing. That's true. We think that breathing's natural when it's actually habitual. Okay. It's a habit that we've formed. And so a lot of us have formed a habit of being a high breather. And if you breathe high, I call this like skinny Instagram posing breathing because if you breathe high, then, you know, you kind of suck in. But what that does is it doesn't give you enough fuel for your voice. It will often push the voice up into the head and give you either restriction or that higher pitch or that wobbliness. Whereas if you bring the breath right down to the belly and then have the sound vibrating behind the walls of the chest from the heart, then no matter who you are, what age, what size, you're going to be able to have a much more heart-centered voice. We sometimes might not want to breathe from the belly because we feel fat. <laughs> yes. Know, like, Whenever I'm doing breathing in workshops or speaking, I'm like, just for the next five minutes, no, in, no photos, no social media. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So let's, um, I just want to hear some more things about experiences you've had since you've been in business. So it's about, it's a couple of years now, is it? Or close to a couple of years? Yeah, almost three years. Cool. Here, um, I'm just looking in my homework again, but there was something, you, you, you talk about an event in Melbourne that you spoke at. Can you, can you talk to us about that and what that meant for you? Absolutely. So quite early on in my business journey, I suppose we could say, I, was, I, did, I wasn't asked to speak. I pitched uh, an event idea to a contact in Melbourne and said I can talk about achieving vocality. And vocality is a made-up word. <laughs> I made it up. And it's what I believe to be the, the role of voice in gender equality. And it's all about how to use your voice, but specifically for a female audience. And I was the, I was the event and it was this nice wine bar and I started speaking and I was feeling pretty good. But somebody at the back of the room reached into their handbag and then somebody else reached into their jacket and I was like, oh my gosh, they're getting their phones. They're really boring. My subconscious was yeah, telling me stories. But then I saw that they were getting out a little notebook. It was so sweet. And I looked around and all these people were taking notes, using the phone as a a light and writing things down. And I just felt so happy in that moment that I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. I'm definitely living my purpose. And it's not just me who loves this stuff, but it's actually having value for other people. Mm. So that was beautiful. Hmm. And how does how does that oh, I'm just vocality. So how does that improve gender equality? <laughs> the idea is if uh, it's just amplifying women's voices. So a lot of the rooms that I speak in, I, I say there are many women who do not have the opportunity to be in rooms like today. And so if we don't find the courage to use our voice and use it well for ourselves, then how can we speak for others? And I go through lots of the practical tips. Pretend you're wearing angel wings. Breathe low and deep. Speak from the heart. Use the falling inflection. Get in there. (laughs) Make your voice heard. Very cool. Yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> and, and I understand as part of your, um, your journey as well that you, there was someone named Annie that you helped out on this topic. So, oh, my gosh. I love her so much. Yeah. So after I went, first went viral on TikTok, I know, I know it seems like a lot of things revolve around this, but it's more just a timeline in my mind. I got this beautiful email which said, Hi, Sally. I do speech and drama teaching. I've never seen somebody with our background, go on to do what you're doing. And I find it really inspirational 
And she's right because often the path is you become a speech and drama teacher, you go into a private school, you have kids come out of class and you teach them poetry. That's your life. So, of course, what I'm doing is a little bit different. And she said, would you be able to, would you consider mentoring me? And gut instinct? It's like, yes, this girl is amazing. 20 years old. Yeah, right. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. I was just drinking too much and dating bad boys when I was 20. So here she (laughs) is reaching out. And I began to meet with her once a month and mentor her with her business and anything else going on. And now she's just killing it. She's got more followers than me on Clubhouse. She's on Instagram. She's got clients all over the world. And I just feel so incredibly proud. I can just tap out and (laughs) she can take over. (laughs) Awesome. And so how long have you been mentoring her for? So since uh, about March last year. Awesome. So about a year. You're still going? Absolutely. I'm going to Sydney yeah. next week and I'm going to see her. So. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, that, that's so cool. Um, would you like to mentor other people? Is that something you'd like to keep doing? Absolutely. I feel like a lot of my students, especially my journalism students who are university or early stage career, it's voice coaching with a side of life coaching. Sure. Yeah. So I wrap it into into that. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Okay, cool. So what's um what's plans for the future? What's to come? What are goals for you? I would like to grow the online business. So I've got an online membership that I'd love love to see more people in, and I have an online course which I run called my six week voice makeover, which I love doing. And I think also my own speaking. So I think TED Talks on the cards. Yeah, cool. Hopefully soon. And yeah, just I love the variety and I like not quite knowing what to expect. Which, of course, every business coach hates when they say, what are your goals for the quarter? And I'm like, what's a quarter again? No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so on, on that then, has your business model changed a little bit over, over the time you, since you've started? Now you've got a membership site, now you've got online course. Has that evolved a lot as well? Yeah, so I'm in the process of trying to build something that is very scalable. Mm. So with the online membership and the online six-week course, they are both where I should be focusing. I'm still doing one-on-one and also corporate workshops. So for voice and presentation and also for media training, having been on both sides of the microphone, (laughs) it puts me in a pretty good position to do media training. And I still love doing that and do do that, but... As you'd understand, that is still a a time for money exchange. And so looking to grow the business where I don't have to do that and can maybe take some time off. (laughs) Be be nice. (laughs) Um, Did you, so you started with that time for money. Was that all you were doing for a while? Yeah. Yeah, How long were you doing that for? So the first six week online course started, would you believe it? March 16, which was Right, I think the week before we went into lockdown. Oh, okay. So that was fantastic. While everything else was getting cancelled, I was like, yeah. we're good. Yeah. We're good to go. And then I launched the membership last uh, October. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And you want to keep on going with that? That's the, that's the way of the future for you, is it? I think so. I've got people from all over the world, which I absolutely love. And... I do like in-person events as well. I used to run voice and vino events nice. where we'd come and drink different wines and I'd just compare how wine was similar to voice because, hey, if you can make a connection, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> and that was great. But even even now, I yeah, have such an international audience that online's the way to go. Yeah, well, mm. makes sense. And if you were to tell yourself something... Um, from when you started your business. And maybe this can relate to someone who might be starting to think about doing their own thing. What would you say? You're going to have a lot of bright, shiny objects out there. Lots of people giving their own advice about how you should do everything in your business, the systems you should use, the marketing you should do, uh, what your products should be, how much you should charge, everything. And... I would say, yes, have a bit of a look around, but close your eyes and listen to yourself and make a decision and then go with that decision. Doesn't Mm. mean you can't change it. Mm. I've changed decisions heaps of times. I've failed very fast in the business. 
But I think that even now that's a lesson for myself is that if you just keep looking around at all the advice being thrown at you, it'll be really hard to commit to something and move forward. So trust your gut. Mm-hmm. We're back to that again, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> and are you, would you be looking to grow a team and that type of thing? I mean, it sounds like you've kind of got a personal brand going on here. So when you look at that growth and would that include team building as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I've got a few co- freelancers that help me out with different things. And yes, there's, uh, it's good if you can get systems to do as many things as you can. But yeah, I think down the track, I'll need a little bit of a tribe to help me out. Sure. Okay. Very cool. Well, um, we'll wrap up in a second. Uh, it's been amazing to get to know you, Sally. I really appreciate you coming in, sharing your story with me and um, being so open about everything that's happened. I mean, you can, I, I really encourage anyone to go and follow you you on Instagram and on TikTok, of course, and all those channels, because you really, you know, you really do put out a a great vibe, I think, into the world. So um, I really appreciate your time today. Oh, Jack, thank you so much. Yeah, I've had a great time. And if there is um, places that people should go to get to know you or to get in touch, what's the best places? Well, I'm not an international woman of mystery. You probably gathered that. So you can find me on every platform. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok. My website is sallyprosser.com.au. Don't forget the AU. And yeah, you can contact me through there. Sure. Or any of the social platforms. Yeah. Or sure. send a pigeon. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever works. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well... Thank you very much, Sally. I really appreciate your time today and I really appreciate you you sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Push Podcast. Show notes can be found at bethepush.com forward slash podcast and clicking on the relevant episode link. Remember to subscribe and I look forward to talking to you again soon.